from downtown Milwaukee, welcome to Money Talk with Bob Landis. Each week, professional advisors from Landis and Company Investments discuss the latest financial developments, offering timely insight and long-term perspective. This is Money Talk for April 29, 2022. Well, your Milwaukee Brewers are hosting the Chicago Cubs this weekend, and need I say more? <laughs> and after finishing off another team from Chicago, the Bucks' playoff run continues with the Celtics this Sunday in Boston. Let's start in Livonia, Michigan. A kindergartner brought a bottle of Jose Cuervo to school and shared it with four of her little friends. <laughs> While she's the most popular kid in class, she's not allowed to ever again bring anything for show and tell. <laughs> Good for her. Brazil has purchased 35,000 doses of Viagra for their military. Well, I don't even know what to say here except thanks for your service. <laughs> Santa Barbara, California is close to declaring its only Chick-fil-A restaurant a public nuisance. It has nothing to do with the food. It's the long drive through lines that have cars backed up onto the street for hours. That's the nuisance. And if you're waiting in line for hours, can you call it fast food? Or can you even call it a drive through <laughs> A man in Kenosha was getting a cavity filled when he inhaled the dentist's drill bit. And because he was all numb from, no from the Novocaine, he didn't even know it. <laughs> so it was off to the hospital where surgeons using an experimental procedure Fish the drill bit out of his lung. Oh, my. I just wonder what they use for bait. <laughs> Triplet sisters in the Democratic Republic of Congo all proposed to the same man on the same day. Although he almost fainted by the polygamous request, he said yes to all three. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but I think he can plead temporary insanity. <laughs> on the podcast today, we have Art Rothschild, Mike Helsel. And wrapping up the week, here's Kyle Tedding. Well, thank you, Max. A rough week overall for stocks, piling on to what have been some pretty meaningful declines. The NASDAQ down 3.9% this week, closing today 12,335. The S&P 500 down 3.3%, closing at 4,132. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 938 points today alone, closing the week down 833 down 2.5%, closing at 32,979 for the year. The NASDAQ now well into correction territory. I'm sorry, now well into bear market territory, down 21%. The S&P back into correction territory, down 129 And the Dow Jones Industrial Average down 8.7% for the year. It's a quick look at the performance for the week. I think, you know, more broadly, Art, as we look at uh, the, the end of April here being another bad month for stocks, another pretty rough month for bonds as well. You know, I think investors are left asking a lot of questions. Uh, but most importantly, the first one's going to be just how bad is this going to look when we get that statement in a couple of days? It's going to look pretty bad. Um, in March was a good month, you know, especially in hindsight. Um, we made money in March, recovering from uh, pretty significant declines for the first two months of the year. Um, in April, it's you forget about it. It's all gone. Um, we're back to worse than where we were, and so I don't want I don't want to candy coat what's going on. It's an important time for investors to to do what I would call a gut check. Why do you have what you have, and realize that there's risk in investing in the stock market. That's why we do what we do. That's why we're here to counsel those with questions. But again, the portal numbers change uh, on the first of every month. So you, those investors who are and, and listeners who are looking at their figures through the end of uh, April now in the portal are going to see some significant declines for the year. But once again, as we've talked about before, in the context of, of the past couple of years, three years, five years, 10 years, you know, we're still ahead. But again, it's a great time to call your advisor, um, to find out what you should be doing differently, if anything, just to give you the peace of mind. We believe in balance. We believe in diversification. Um, safe assets today are pretty much cash. Um, looking forward, as you'll comment on, I'm sure, you know, there, there's opportunities. But, um, you know, this, this is not a good month by, by, by any stretch of the imagination. And Art, I think maybe the bigger challenge is not that stocks are down. We expect that month to month that's going to happen. The bigger challenge is that we've continued to see 
interest rates move higher, which puts pressure on bond prices. Investors need to remember that bond prices and interest rates tend to move inversely. Uh, and so when we're seeing interest rates move higher, we see bond prices tend to move lower. I think there's a couple of challenges there short term, but let's all remember that long term, there, there haven't been a lot of meaningful changes in the last month. We haven't gotten a lot of new information that tells us that the next six months, the next year, the next five years look all that different than what we thought before. And so if anything, this is setting up for future returns to look even a little bit better uh, as valuations on stocks have come down, as the interest rates you can get on your bonds now have gone up. Both of those things to me suggest that you know we can finally expect a little more from stocks and bonds than what we had been expecting when the forward PE on the S&P was 21 or 22. Well, now it's down below 18 when the yield you could get on your bonds was a quarter or a half a percent if you were lucky. And now you can get one, one and a half, two. All of a sudden, those things look far more attractive. And so, you know, I think it is a gut check. It certainly is a reminder that you have an advisor for a reason. Don't hesitate to call us. Don't hesitate to, to make sure that what you have is still what you want. Um, but I think, you know, if, if you entered this pretty comfortable with the way you were positioned, there haven't been a lot of fundamental changes that suggest that you need to be doing anything different. Yeah, and this was not a week in which, as you indicated, anything really happened. You know, other than, you know, some news came out, you know, on corporate profits being better or worse than expected. Most, as, as you, you're well aware and have, have commented on frequently, corporate profits are coming in higher than anticipated. This should be good news. In past quarters, it has been. But, but some people are just looking for excuses to sell. And there are speculators out there. There's stuff like meme stocks that, you know, have been clobbered lately because people aren't, you know, as excited about investing. So you're going to see some air coming out of this balloon. But as you, you indicated, uh, with yields being higher, um, bonds are going to be more attractive going forward. They couldn't be much less attractive than they were uh, in the first quarter. And, and stocks, uh, dividend-paying stocks, some of which have done very well relative to growth stocks. Growth stocks have shown why they have a reputation of, of being more volatile. They hadn't been for the past 10 years. So it's about time that people you know, got this reality check to realize, yeah, you should get help. They, our clients help, have help making good decisions, and a good decision is to develop a, a well-diversified, well-balanced portfolio and, and stay in the game. You know, I think it's interesting. We got a, quite a bit of earnings information late this week on some of the, the big tech names. Mike, I know you've had some thoughts this week on maybe the role that technology stocks and growth stocks more broadly play in portfolios. Yeah, I mean, to Art's point, I mean, growth stocks have just been hammered for this first four months of the year. And they've been the ones that have driven the market. I mean, a handful of names have driven the market for the past three years. So I personally, we've had a lot of conversations about growth stocks with clients. And I've actually been putting some money into some growth stocks, large cap growth stocks, um, for the clients that can handle it, right? That can take on a little bit more risk, mainly younger clients, right? Because you look at some of the funds that we use more broadly, and the top names of these growth funds are Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, and these companies aren't going anywhere. It's not a matter of if they recover, it's when. Um, and growth stocks in general, like growth companies in general, have been kind of fascinating to me for a couple of reasons. But one is, and you guys will realize where I'm going here, is they're, <laughs> with, they're getting into more sports-related content, right? So you look at Amazon, Apple, they're starting to dip their toe into the NFL, Major League Baseball. Um, and to try and open up new revenue streams, right? So one that's interesting to me is Amazon. They're doing 30 WNBA games this year, but they're doing the local games for the Seattle Storm that are only available to the people in Seattle. And what they're going to try and experiment with is target-based ads, right? So if you search on your computer and you're watching that Seattle Storm game in Seattle, you may see an ad for whatever you search. I'm not even going to get into what people search for. That's not my place. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. But... It's another possible revenue stream that could help bring back growth stocks a little bit quicker. But as you said, Art, if you're going to get into it right now, you have to be willing to put up with a little volatility. And for some people, they can. Well, I think, Mike, that's such a critical thing to understand about how much investing has shifted over the past few years. You think about some of the old guard businesses that 
uh, have drastically changed operations to capture what the new revenue streams look like, whether it's you know, the, the Amazons of the world where most people don't even really fully appreciate where their revenue comes from to maybe some of the, you know, media companies that have just become digital streaming companies. And so, you know, I think there's there's all these opportunities out there. And I think we're so quick to say, well, what new business might be the business that provides that opportunity? We forget sometimes that often it's those well-established big businesses that are just uh, able to spend in order to shift focus, able to uh, pivot to better opportunities that you know potentially lead to revenue sources we hadn't anticipated. That's the nature of investing, and in particular, I think it's the nature of growth investing is trying to capture those great ideas. You know, I think as we look at some of the earnings data from this week, it's clear that uh, we remain on pace about halfway through the first quarter earnings release uh, to to grow right where we thought we would, about uh, 12.5% earnings growth for the first quarter, still counting on maybe upper single digits, looking at a little north of 9% earnings growth for all of this year, potentially another 9% next year. And what all that leads to is an environment in which as stocks have been selling off, all of a sudden the S&P broadly looks relatively attractive again from a from a forward price to earnings perspective. Keep in mind, at the start of the year, we were talking about a forward P and the S&P 500 north of 20. We're now down below 18, I think, as I mentioned a bit earlier. Uh, and so while that still is a bit above the long-term average, you know, Art, I think there's some opportunities from a valuation perspective now. And of course, if what we care about is earnings and interest rates, those earnings make their way to where we think they'll be. All of a sudden, you know, I think stocks long-term remain kind of attractive here. Yeah, and I'm going to put in a plug for uh, the article you just wrote that I talked about exactly that. You know, it is all about interest rates and earnings. One of your clients asked you a, a very good question. What What is that that Bob's always told us to be paying attention to? And the earnings portion is doing great and, and should continue to do great. This is a very strong domestic economy, some concerns about the global economy. Um, but going forward, I can expect, you can expect, we can all expect corporate profits to grow. With interest rates a little bit higher, that's the adjustment the markets are going through right now. What are those future earnings worth today? And I think your article does a great job, you know, reviewing that. So I'm going to call our, you know, listeners' attention to that one. I think, as always, we've got a, a pretty great newsletter coming out. Uh, you know, we publish on a monthly basis, an article from me, usually an article from Joel, a few others uh, that contribute pretty regularly. And I think important, if you're uh, thinking about what's going on in the world right now, it's a great resource for our investors, for our readers, for our clients to kind of get an idea of, okay, here's how Landis and Company is thinking about what's going on right now. And so some great opportunities, I think, there right now. Joel has a, an excellent article that you contributed to, Art, talking about uh, kind of the role that fixed income plays, uh, and in particular, the role that it plays for so many Americans now that don't have access to defined benefits or kind of the traditional pension, but more reliant on, you know, 401ks or traditional defined contributions. And, and, you know, maybe Art, shed a little light on how we should think about that fixed income piece of our portfolio. Yeah, I think Joel's article does a wonderful job of highlighting what I'm going to suggest is compartmentalization. You know, in times like these, when your portfolio appears to be going up and down like crazy, you, you have to look at what, what do you have that you can count on? And as, as Joel points out, uh, pensions that people were getting monthly, you, you count on those. Social Security, you count on those. So if you don't have those or you, you don't have the pension to fall back on, you do have the fixed portion of your portfolio um, that should be relatively stable, which you should count on for those monthly payments, so you don't have to worry about stocks going up and down as they always do. So again, it gets you to compartmentalize, to not worry about risks, focus on what you have going for you on a regular basis, which is some safe money. So, again, highly recommended reading. Yeah, Mike, maybe I'll give you the tough question for the week. We see uh, <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Fidelity announcing this week that they're going to introduce Bitcoin for their 401k <laughs> investors. Uh, it, it strikes me, you know, just talking about this transition away from defined benefits from, you know, what many Americans enjoyed, in particular many uh, blue-collar workers enjoyed for – uh, much of the earlier generations, which was a pretty, uh, you know, guaranteed income stream for retirement. Um, and as we've increased our reliance on these 401ks, 
Uh, it's amazing to me that, um, you know, we would decide to introduce some of these types of investment vehicles. Uh, I, I'm sure you hear from clients on occasion that are looking for some of these uh, less traditional vehicles, but thoughts on, uh, you know, the appropriateness of uh, these types of things for investors. Okay. Whew. All right. I will try not to get in trouble here. Um, <laughs> no. Yeah, it's, it is fascinating how Art brought up kind of pensions and Social Security and stuff like that. You're seeing a lot more pensions now just go away. Like most companies, they don't even want to pay them out. They'll, I've got a couple of clients that are just taking lump sum buyouts because the pension company just wants it off the book. So those aren't, if you have a pension, that is terrific, but that's not something you can really rely on for most people going forward in the future. In regards to Bitcoin and 401k, um, yeah, I've had a few clients talk to me about Bitcoin and investing. And again, it's very volatile to say the least. And I break it down like this for people. First of all, I ask them one question. What makes Bitcoin go up or down? And I usually get blank stares. So right then and there, when I, they don't have a response, I tell them Bitcoin is not for you. If you can't tell me why it goes up or down, then you shouldn't get on that ride. But I also put it in kind of a real world perspective and kind of relate to my own life in terms of, as a lot of people may know, I've mentioned on this podcast, I enjoy going to Las Vegas for multiple reasons. But when I go out there with my wife, we have basically a gambling budget, right? That we know this X amount is going to be used for slots, roulette, whatever. We do not plan on coming home with that money. And I phrase it in that way for Bitcoin, knowing if you want to get into Bitcoin and take a small, very, very small portion of your retirement portfolio and put it into Bitcoin, okay, but go in there with the clear eyes of there's a chance you're not coming home with that money. Or you better be prepared to have a really volatile ride with it. And when I say that, most people want to stay away from it because with your 401ks, that's it. That's what you're banking on to retire. So if you're banking on Bitcoin and a very speculative investment to retire, there's a chance you're going to get left holding the bag and not be able to retire until you're 95. So I would advise against it for the vast majority of people if they are offered it in their 401ks. I think what I... When I wrote down the question and when I, when I first read the headline to that article, the, the thing that struck me was just because we can do something, it doesn't mean we should do something. <laughs> I say that to my kids all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's, uh, it's important to understand that today's workers rely on their 401k far more than uh, the workers of generations past. They're, it's going to be the thing that provides for the vast majority of their retirement income, hopefully, right? You hope that it, it grows the way you expect it to um, and that you don't make poor choices along the way. And I think one of the, the necessary evils of that is that we have to put some guardrails on, um, you know, what, what kinds of investments we put in these portfolios. And so I think, you know, there's a, a risk to investors not understanding the volatility that exists there. Uh, and, and so again, I think, you know, while you may want to have a little piece here or there, it may interest you or it may be something that you want to, uh, you know, just participate in to say you're participating. Um, there's something to be said for tried and true. There's something to be said for, um, you know, long-term predictable results. And I think if you look at stock and bond markets over extended periods of time, and that's what 401ks really are, is vehicles that are designed to to begin at a very early point in your uh, working years and last through your retirement years, well, that's an extended period of time. It's, you know, those more traditional investments, I think, that are the things that should get us, uh, you know, to the, the long-term benefits that, that we expect from 401ks, from investments overall. I just want to say, to kind of couple, piggyback on what you're saying, if you are looking at the market today and what it's doing in the past four months, and you are panicking or freaking out about it, then Bitcoin is not for you because you are going to have bigger swings with that than just your, like you said, Kyle, just traditional balanced portfolio that we do. 
if you cannot handle what's going on right now in the market, then you should avoid Bitcoin completely. But maybe it's time for a trip to Vegas. I mean, it is, but... <laughs> Yeah, with uh, a few folks around the table today having <laughs> plenty of experience with the uh, with the Vegas community, I think uh, you know maybe appropriate that we're talking about Bitcoin. You know, I think just a couple of other things to touch on this week on the economic front. We got a release on gross domestic product uh, for the first quarter uh, at an annual rate. You could say from quarter uh, four to, to quarter one of this year, the economy slowed at 1.4 percent, although. You know, it's it's all in how you measure and what you measure against. And as uh, you know, Joel and I were talking earlier in the week. I think it's important to note that year over year, that GDP number is still positive, still shows growth at three point six percent in the first quarter. And so, you know, I think it, it very much is how you measure. It was one of the strangest GDP reports I've ever seen. Not to mention the market reaction. You know, stocks soared yesterday. I mean, they plummeted today. They soared yesterday on on this news because buried in those numbers is the fact that consumer spending. Uh, rose at a 2.7% annual rate. Business spending went up 9.2%. And it's only the fact that uh, imports increased um, or the balance of trade you know, was, was worse that the number was negative. And, and that, that type of thing could continue as the dollar keeps strengthening and we keep importing more of you know, what we need. So it was a really fluky you know, report, I thought. Yeah, I think, you know, you, you mentioned consumers, Mike. It's something you've looked at quite a bit as well and in, in conversations with clients. But it just appears that consumers aren't phased by inflation. The confidence numbers have uh, been just fine. The sentiment numbers have been just fine. And then you look at spending, and it does not appear that consumers are in a position right now where they're squirreling away funds for a rainy day. They're trying to take advantage of uh, what they haven't been able to do. Absolutely. I've, I've talked to numerous clients that, I mean, it's kind of like, what inflation? Right there? I mean, I've been also reading some things. You're looking at uh, airline numbers that are going up. You're looking at hotels, reservations going up. I mean, I think the way people are looking at it is like, listen, for the past two years, I've behaved. I haven't gone out. I've worn, or if I have, I've worn my mask. I haven't gone on vacation. And But this summer, I'm going on vacation. I'm taking, I might not take the longer road trip because gas is a little bit more expensive, but I'm taking the road trip or I'm taking the, the trip out to Vegas, nice callback. But like, <laughs> but they're going. It's it's down the line. So many clients I talk to are like, we're going this summer. And again, this area of the country we live in, when it gets warmer out, people are going out. We don't get a lot of nice weather around here. So when it happens, we're gonna go do stuff. And so, yeah, it's just fascinating to see that all the talk about inflation was really gonna like suppress some consumer spending. I mean, and it has to somewhat. I mean, that's just naturally. But no, people are still going out. I mean, I think Kyle, you brought it up earlier this week that credit card debt is, I think, pretty much back to pre-pandemic levels. I mean, I think that's just going to continue, especially as we get into the summer months. Yeah, Mike, I think that's critical is remember, of course, that consumption is uh, or individual consumption is two thirds of our economic uh, kind of powerhouse. And we're great spenders. Americans do an excellent job of spending money. Uh, we sure make a lot of money and we find plenty of places to spend it. And so the best way you continue economic growth is to see that consumption continue to take place. And so the thing we watch is consumer spending. The thing we watch is how consumers feel about the future, because ultimately, you know, that should inform us uh, when consumers start to get a little wary, we should probably maybe take our foot off the gas a little bit because, again, it is it is really consumption that drives the bus there. Well, Art, Mike, Max, thanks for joining me this week. As always, enjoy doing the program for you, and we'll talk to you again next week. Thank you for listening to Money Talk with Bob Landis. If you have a financial question you want answered on next week's show, email it to moneytalk at landis.com. To keep informed throughout the week, visit our Money Talk page at Landis.com. <laughs>